Everyone, welcome to Eater Research Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Gothicken. And today I'm joined by Francis Branken, Head of Economy at Shrapnel. None of this is financial or legal advice. Francis, thanks for joining. Can you briefly introduce yourself and tell us how you ended up at Shrapnel? Yeah, for sure. So I did a, a brief stint in the aerospace industry. I uh, started off doing kind of reinforcement learning applications for, for drone tech mainly. Uh, so that's like swarm tech, um, image recognition applications for drones, that kind of thing. And then um, kind of during COVID, because uh, most of that works in office, I was just dabbling with crypto, got really, really into doing analysis, became a kind of freelance analyst for uh, various people looking for tech advice, mainly in like layer ones and layer twos, helping projects decide, you know, what's the mo most appropriate place to deploy themselves. And at that point, I met some of the uh, kind of founders in Shrapnel. Uh, I was good friends with Calvin, who's head of BD, uh, and you know, I, you know, talked to him regularly about where they should go, what they should do, and, and that's kind of how I found my way into the team. They just eventually picked me up, and then kind of been there since January, twenty twenty-two. So yeah, January this year. Awesome, man. Let's talk about the game itself, Shrapnel. Sure. What is it? Tell us about the game. I know it's a first-person shooter game, but let's let's get deeper into that. Yeah, it's, it's a first-person extraction-style shooter. So if anyone's familiar with Escape from Tarkov, it emulates that style of gameplay. If you're not, uh, kind of how it functions is you have a continuous inventory. So typical FPS games are all in a vacuum. Once you finish that lobby, what you've done that session doesn't affect kind of what's going on in the, the next sessions. Extraction shooters have this kind of RPG layer on top of them, where if you go into a session, you get some loot and you get that loot out alive, that goes into kind of your loot bag effectively. Uh, the the nice thing with extraction shooters, so it, it is similar to a battle royale in the sense of you have a set amount of players that are on a battlefield. The only difference is you can choose when to leave. And when you do leave, as I said, that gear that you previously got goes into your infantry and you can take it to the next game. So you have this rolling uh, kind of persistent character that you're constantly evolving the play style or, you know, whatever it is uh, you're trying to collect. And it, it does kind of one, I think, key thing for the gamer. If you look at Battle Royale games, you know, you've got like a one in a hundred chance of winning if everyone had an even, even skill level. With extraction shooters, it's much more dynamic. You can set your own win conditions. Some people might be going in to get as many kills as possible. Some people might be going in to gear up for the next three games. They're looking for specific items so they can have their favorite loadout. Some people might just be going in so they can um, kind of practice and acquire more loot and figure a new strategy out. So everyone can go in with a different purpose. It's not just, I want to be the last alive. And we think that adds a lot more kind of dynamic interest for the players. It facilitates a larger skill boundary. So no one has to get sick and tired of losing because in reality, you're defining how you win. So you can satisfy yourself in a much easier way than, than you can in other games. Interesting. So I'm personally not familiar with extraction shooters. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not familiar with Escape, Escape from Tarkov. Um, but I'm very familiar with Battle Royale and MOBA yeah. type shooter games. So, um, based on what you just said, you know, as a, as a, say, as a player, you know, like you, you put hundred players in an island analogy from, you know, PUBG and Fortnite. Yeah. Um, I can leave whenever I want, meaning, so if, yes. if I die, you know, once, can I join the game back again or how, how, how does that work? Yeah. So it's, um, Everyone loads in at the start of the session and no one can then join after the fact. Um, so, you know, once, you, once you're in, that is the people you're in with. People can choose to try and extract. Uh, one of the key things that happens there is, you know, there's a some kind of marker to show that this person is trying to extract so that you have the chance to then react and, you know, maybe you go and kill them. Uh, there's some level of risk in doing that. And if they do successfully extract, then any gear that they acquired and the gear that they had on them at the time goes into their inventory. If you kill them, you take everything that they're carrying. Same same way that a battle royale works currently. You know, you get all that loot that they currently have on them. Uh, so you're constantly risking. It's a zero-sum uh, gameplay loot. Nothing is uh, kind of created in that. It's all whatever you take in and whatever you loot in the game, there is no added 
an uh, element of inflation to that. It's just uh, zero sum at best. Okay, interesting. And when you say extract, is that a mode or any player who is playing a um, shrapnel match at that moment, they're all by default extractive players, right? If, if I, I yes. have some loot that I, I, I have some gear that I looted from maybe boxes or other players, if I lose them, I lose it all. But if I just exit mm -hmm. the game, those inventory stays in my um, wallet or dashboard. Yes, yeah. So if you if you manage to extract successfully, that all goes into your uh, well, yeah, it will be stored on your wallet, but it'll be in game, shown in your your inventory. And and similar to battle royale games, would there be like you know loots around when I'm walking as a player? Yes, yeah. So as the game progresses, uh, that loot will get more and more valuable. So that's an incentive to kind of stay uh, to the end. And that kind of means that, you know, the, the more newer players, the players with lower skill or the players with less appetite for, for combat, they'll most likely sit in the first one third of the game trying to loot up and then extract as soon as possible once they've got what they want. You have the people that are a bit more combat savvy that they kind of enjoy that little adrenaline rush. They'll stay in for, for the second third of the game. And then that final third is where you have your best players or the people with that highest risk appetite that are going after the best loot. Uh, and that kind of emulates the same structure as poker, where you know you, you get the, the, the option to leave and reduce uh, kind of your uh, risk that you're exposed to on each, you know, the flop, the turn, and the river. And it's, it's taking that style and putting it into a, a shooter is a good way to have an analogy for that. Got it. So I, I, I do see a scenario where there are some players who just want to extract, right? They don't want to take a lot of risks. They're just playing. They're just looking around for loot that they can open and extract um, without getting killed, and then they're going to leave the game. Is that, is that yeah. possible? That is possible. Yeah, what we want to do is facilitate as many play styles as possible. We, we even want to facilitate the type of people that don't want to engage in combat. They just want to sneak around and stay to the end maybe and then pick someone off. Uh, the kind of philosophy that we've got as a studio is to make sure that however you want to play the game, you have the agency to decide to do that. If you're someone that just wants to loot up at the start, not fight anyone and leave, if you're someone that's to go wants to go gung-ho and try and kill as many people as possible, you can do that as well. Like We, we want to balance uh, the game so that anyone uh, really has the, the chance to play. Got it. And And, you know, if I'm a good player, if I'm a good shooter player, I might be, let's say I, I have ended up, let's say the game started with 100 players and I ended up in the last 20. And now it's really high sticks, right? I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in the map with really good, let's say, shooter players. Of course, we're making assumptions. Uh, and I have looted so far a uh, good amount of inventory. Um, and there are, you know, good rewards as well. But, you know, there, I guess that that poker table analogy makes a lot of sense, right? I I yes. might fault. I might just say this is enough and, and go back home and keep the inventory I have, or I can just double down on, on, on exactly. more. Exactly. It's, it's completely up to the, the player to decide at what point they want to get out. Um, I know that you not played escape from Tarkov, but the way their game works is it's constantly like maximum tension the whole way through, just flatlined your heart's racing the whole time. We want to kind of have a cadence where it's slowly builds up and then you can choose to jump off at whatever point that you want to. Um, so as, as you said, like you can de-risk at whatever point in the game you decide, Hey, this is enough for me. I've got what I wanted. I'm just going to try and get out. Yeah. I mean, the shooter games are mostly about the adrenaline boost, right? Exactly. So exactly. It, it does makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing we wanted to be able to do is facilitate as many as possible, as many, uh, kind of types of players as possible. So having that continuously increasing suspension with the continuously increasing risk and then giving the better players, you know, they have to do certain things to set up to be able to play in the later game. You, know, you have different types of kits where you might have to collect in-game uh, resources to you know, power your character up so they are able to fight at, at the later stages. Do it, giving people things to do so that they can get to the point of suspension that they want and have the adrenaline rush that they, they desire without having everyone sat at, you know, max uh, heart rate the whole time. That's not what you want. You want to, you know, 
give people periods, ups and downs of that uh, so that they can play for a long period of time and enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. How, how many players would be per each match? So we have a very in-depth use generated content system uh, and we'll be letting the map creators decide how many players they want between the numbers of 10 and 40. So they can design the flow uh, for that map and how they want players to play it. And also the size, which will be key for, you know, deciding is it 10, is it 40, is it 20? What number is that? And how long will, will the average game last? We're anticipating the longest the game should go is around 45 minutes. Uh, we can, you know, like obviously you have the autonomy to leave when you want, but the, the point where we're going to make the environment so deadly that it's difficult to extract, almost even impossible, would be around that 45 minute mark. Which is a pretty long... Um, yes. All right. Yeah. But it, that, so that'll be, if no one's deciding to extract, there's no gun battles, that's kind of what we're looking at. But that's a, a dynamic number where, say, in the first 10 minutes, uh, it's a 20-player it's a 20 player game and 18 players leave. Well, we're going to kickstart the end game with the best loot at that point already. It's not going to be, oh, now I have to wait uh, for another 35 minutes before the good stuff happens. So it's, yeah, it's, it's balancing with the player base as well, but max time we're looking at if, you know, it's a low combat, everyone's sneaking around, no one's trying to extract, you're looking at around 45 minutes at max time, but you're probably going to see closer to 20, 25 type of thing. When you use the word extract, you mean the PvP battle where someone ends up dying, right? Uh, I mean the actual uh, event of extracting. So, for example, it could be shooting a flare in the air, a helicopter comes to pick you up, could be getting on one of the drop ships, that, that type of thing. Uh, not actually engaging in PvP combat. These are, when you're extracting, it's I have collected something, whether it's through combat, whether it's through finding gear on the map, and you're actually partake, like participating in an extraction event, which, you know, as I said, could be a helicopter picking you up, could be a dropship that you get on and, and, and escape through that. What, what do you mean by helicopter picking you up? It's Is it like a, are they going to like uh, PV enemies as well? Uh, well, so this would be, you know, so, uh, something flies over, you rappel up a rope type of thing. Uh, other people can see that. So that is, there is risk in extraction. You don't just get to go, okay, cool. I've got all the stuff I want. Now I'm going to leave risk-free. That's not how it works. There are uh, events that will trigger to make it so players can see, hey, this person is trying to leave. And you know, the later you get into the game, the more risky that becomes because the more those players are incentivized about, okay, this dude might have some really good stuff and they might try and kill you during that. So you have to be tactical with how you extract from the sessions as well. Oh, and is that the only way to leave the game? Leaving with yes. a helicopter? Oh. Uh, was it not necessarily a helicopter? That's just an example, but you know, drop ships, that type of thing. Uh, where you have to get somewhere to a, a place where someone could pick you up or you have to complete a certain event so that you can store your loot and, and take it home with you effectively. So you can't just like uh, turn off your computer and assume that all your inventory is no. going to in your wallet. No, like... you've got to assess the risks. Is this the right time? Am I in the right place? Is there you know, a lot of people around me right now? Am I going to uh, kind of trigger everyone to turn around and come start a gunfight with me? You've got to weigh up all of that if you want to actually leave the session. And as you progress through the game, um, is it a bit like in in games like Dota or, or League of Legends where your hero or character is getting upgraded in, inside yes. that game? Yeah, we have... Um, so there's different ways that you can design your loadouts. Some loadouts you might come in and it's very early game focused uh, and it's, it's all about just killing as many people as possible at the start and trying to take their loot. Some loadouts are about uh, collecting resources in the map uh, so you can kind of build that, that power level up and it is focused mainly around getting to that end game and then obviously you have the mid game points. So as, a, as someone building your, your gear and your kind of play style, there is that element. And then outside the actual game itself, similar to a lot of FPSs, you have a character progression arc where um, we have things like persistent in injuries. So say you get shot in the arm a lot, it might actually affect how your recall works. You can heal that up, but 
there's the idea that you have this character that you're continuously playing with uh, that is either taking damage or getting upgraded based on how you play. So it actually makes you think about when you're engaging a lot more because it's like, hey, uh, me and this person could have a gunfight right now, but if they uh, you know, shoot me in the leg too much, maybe I'll run slower. So there's a lot of this uh, going on in terms of decision making. So there's both that in-game gear aspect, which you were alluding to with like League of Legends with early, mid, late game characters. And then there's also the uh, persistent character, which is outside of the game, which you're trying to level up and uh, make sure that they're as powerful as possible. If my character is shot by my leg um, and I end up you know, running slower, would that be only for that specific match or would that affect my character permanently? So if you don't heal up, so after you get out of the session, you don't treat those injuries, it, it, there is potential that that would affect you later on. Uh, it's what we want to do in this world is have the sense of consequence. Uh, we want you to look at every decision that you're making and it actually has value. So if you have a, like, you know, you've max leveled your character and then you're just going run and gun everywhere, but you don't have the med packs to be able to heal up afterwards. Well, now your character is going to be affected in some way. So it reduces the power level. And we're trying to make sure that what happens is everything that you do affects something in the future, whether that's in this session or the next session. And it's really about being able to tell a player story uh, from the, the actual individual player's perspective. Uh, and especially if you're in a team, you know, you might have this decision where it's like, you know, three of you are injured, but one of you is perfectly healthy and you run across this team where it looks like all of them are injured. Do you then take that risk of further damaging your character? Or do you go, okay, we've got the upper hand because we can tell something's wrong with them type of thing. It adds a lot more weight uh, to the engagements that you're getting in. Yeah, definitely. I mean, very interesting. Constantly you have to make choices, right? A lot of yes. like, game theory choices constantly. And assuming that real money is involved, because if real money is not involved, you know, you might still get, get the adrenaline boost by the, making these decisions. But once real money is involved, things actually get much more spicy. Yes. And yeah, exactly. So we do facilitate uh, kind of free to play. And then there is for the more hardcore players uh, that ranked, not ranked, but paid aspects, which, you know, you can kind of uh, classify as what would traditionally be in games ranked and unranked play where unranked play is for the, the people that just want to play the game. They enjoy the game loop. They're not too interested in having that huge general in rush. But then ranked is kind of where you find uh, the people that really love, you know, the high heart rate, high intensity type gameplay. So you'd split them typically ranked and unranked. We're having a free to play section where you can earn your way into uh, the paid section and then just the direct paid section uh, where, you know, that's more adrenaline, but less casual players will sit in there. Got it. So, so the unranked play, the free to play version is for for people you know who don't want to buy NFTs or, or who don't want to pay for the battery stuff, and yes. a small percentage might be able to make their way into the battery um, gameplay, right? Yes. But, yeah. but to be to be able to play the ranked play mode, you have to actually buy um, NFTs. So you, well, what do you need to you, buy? Yeah, you don't have to. You you need to hold um, something that is an NFT. So yes, you can buy them. Uh, but you can also just play the free to play content and then effectively, you know, earn by either getting something from the non tokenized economy, uh, like a, a set of, uh, like I'll use gold as an example, just cause it's an easy thing to uh, kind of wrap your head around. Like you keep playing, you get a ton of gold and then you can purchase as a loadout to go into the paid session. You now you play 10 games over here in the, in the free to play section, and then you can take that uh, gold that you've earned, buy something and, and play in the paid session. Uh, so you do have access to get there and you will level up your character faster in a paid session, uh, but you don't actually ever have to put money into the game. If you're good at the game, you could uh, go into the paid session, keep killing people, be net positive. But as a, a free to play player, you don't really care too much if you're net negative in the paid sessions because you're getting that stuff for free and it's just a way uh, for you to uh, kind of level up your character faster and get uh, exposed to things that are more uh, kind of serious in the ecosystem that you can't get outside of that uh, paid session, like certain types of loot, that kind of thing. And also the potential to, you know, extract and be able to sell some of that gear into the market if that's your thing or try and get good enough so that you can 
keep amassing more loot and progressing in kind of the rank section of the play. Got it. Can you walk us through um, a web tree player's journey? You know, I want to buy yeah. whatever is necessary, and I want to play the the ranked play. Yeah. So all you do is you know you've got your custodial or non custodial wallet. Uh, the web three journey in the custodial wallet solution looks very, I mean, basically exactly the same as every other web two game. You sign in with an email and password. You kind of interact with the the UI, and then you can onboard fiat currency with you know uh, your your credit card, PayPal, whatever it is, uh, and then you just go to the marketplace after you've done that and you purchase some NFTs. But it would look the exact same as any other web two game. If you're using a non-custodial wallet, you just bridge over, you know, some funds to the subnet, and that like that would be in, in Shrap, which is the token uh, for the for the game, and then you know you skip the sign in with email and password. You don't have to onboard your fiat. You've already got it on the platform because you bridged, uh, and then you just go to the marketplace. So very simple user journeys for both. Uh, the kind of key there is Web two folks and some Web three folks might not want to bridge funds over. They might just want to get it directly from the platform. So having a two-step process there is key, where it's just email and password, credit card, just like a regular game. Uh, but the people that already have money in crypto, they've kind of done all the Coinbase, whatever you use for fee onboarding. So you just you know purchase Shrap, bridge it over, purchase from the marketplace. Both two-step processes, really low friction, trying to make it as easy as possible for people. OK. Um on the crypto transferring side, so let's say I bought Shrap token on um, a centralized exchange, or mm -hmm. should, should I say a decentralized exchange for, for the sake of the example? Either is fine. Okay. Um, let's say I bought it on, I don't know, Binance, um, and then um, I, I I transfer it to a AVAX C chain, and then yep. from AVAX C chain, I bridge it to Shrapnel's own subnet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so uh, we can work with exchanges to have the token directly on the subnet so that you could withdraw directly to there because uh, it just works like any other blockchain. You you just have to set that up with the with the exchange itself. Or, as you said, you could go directly to the C-chain. You, know, you could even go to Ethereum, Polygon, whatever it is, um, and use like a bridge like Layer Zero, uh, which uh, would then just allow you to bridge straight over. And then we'll make that UI really clean and smooth for you. So it's very simple. Uh, I can't hear you. My bad, I was on mute. Um, is, is there a direct bridge from, let's say, Polygon, Ethereum, Solana, um, from from those blockchains directly to the Shrapnel subnet? Or would I have to go through the AVAX C chain first? Yeah, if, if we have bridges on other chains, it will go directly to the subnet. It won't uh, like kind of go through the C chain then to the subnet. So you'll just go, if it was Ethereum, uh, you would go Ethereum directly to the Shrapnel subnet. So there's no you know step in between that. Is that the case currently or is that like future? That, that is the, the planned case, yes. I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, so bridging from the C chain to the subnet works in the same way as bridging from Ethereum to the subnet. It's the exact same process, so we don't we're not actually adding any technical lift there, because uh, they are separate chains that are communicating separately. So you're you're using the same tech. All you're doing is deploying a contract on Ethereum instead of the C chain. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's more about, especially on the centralized exchange side, more about them approving it. Because I remember it yes. took them a long time to even approve the C chain. First they approved the X chain, yeah. and the C chain, got it. Okay, um, and and so in terms of NFTs, what are the different sets of NFTs? And when I ask this, I'm not asking like, you know, there can be hero A and hero B. I'm, I'm more mm -hmm. like interested in, you know, maybe they're like hero NFTs and the weapon NFTs and armor NFTs, ammunition NFTs. How, how did you segment the NFTs like that? Yeah, so ev everything is an NFT other than bullets and consumables. So you have your gear, you mentioned uh, your kind of heroes or what we're calling characters. If you level that up enough, you can kind of lock it in as an NFT and have that in what we're referring to as your kind of base. But the, the gear is all NFTs that is tradable on the marketplace. Uh, idea being, uh, this is for the paid session. Uh, the idea being that, you know, if you're 
you can monetize being good at the game and also provides liquidity for people to kind of get into the game itself. Then on the kind of creator side, because we're a UGC oriented platform where we want players to create content for the game itself, uh, you have maps, which is, you know, an entire uh, map asset that you can play. You have what we're referring to as prefabs, which could be anything from a bridge to an entire uh, block of buildings to, you know, just a rock or a pebble that you've made. Uh, so they are objects that go into the map to create the entire experience. And then you have on the kind of vanity section side, a skin, which, you know, is, is a wrapper for the, the body of a rifle, the scope, whatever it is, uh, all the way down to like decals, which is just, it could be a straight line. Um, so sorry, sorry, stickers, which could be a straight line and then decals, which is like a combination of stickers to make some kind of pattern. Uh, so we have NFTs in the creator section for, for maps, NFTs in the skin section, and just your basic gear NFTs, which will be the weapon itself, the helmet, the body, the legs, that type of thing. Why did you decide to go with um, NFTs for the creators? So we, we did that so that um, we could attribute royalties to the people that made that content. Uh, it also gives them a chance to, you know, if interoperability becomes a thing, they have all the information they need to take it into another game. You know, they have the, the actual UE5 file, uh, you know, ping, uh, pinned to the, to the NFT, and then also their, their kind of creator address that they want the royalties paid to. Uh, and I think one thing that we're trying to do differently is they can set their own terms. So if you make an entire map or an entire skin, you can set the royalty structure for people to use that or, or purchase that content uh, straight outright from you. So for example, uh, you could have a skin where it's either five dollars up front or if someone wants to go and customize it further and then make future secondaries they have to pay um 50 percent of all the revenue they generate actually goes to you instead of them so you, it's about giving creators the freedom and the choice uh, to monetize and if they don't want to do that they don't have to but it's much much easier with nfts and it's much more transparent that way so people know what they're interacting with yeah that makes sense but it's also, it, it also comes with a cost, right? Like now they have to yes. actually pay for buying the building yeah. versus- Yeah, they have to mint it, it. yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it also means that, uh, I mean, you could set your, you know, the value of your work to free if you want to, if you're just someone that wants to make content, that's what you enjoy doing. You don't really care about monetization. You can do that, but there are kind of some people that will spend tens, maybe hundreds of hours building something uh, and it, it could become extremely popular, like you saw this a lot in CSGO uh, and, you know, StarCraft and, and WarCraft. A lot of people made a lot of content, but those people that made some of the best content never made any money. Uh, and if they wanted to do that with a, without the way we're designing the platform, they can. If they don't want to do that, they don't have to. Um, you know, there's there's the approach that it's it's your choice. Do whatever you want. Got it. And, and these buildings, are they going to be limited in supply? Uh, no, so it's okay. you, you pay the mint fee, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, like we're just okay. kind of, you're paying to effectively store it and have it called as much as you want. So, you know, there could be a million maps that get minted. There could be 10 million buildings. We're not uh, going to limit the supply of, of that. Got it, got it. Okay. Then, then, then it makes a lot of sense. It's more like an identifier rather than an economic. Yes. Yeah. Symbol. So it's, it, we're using it so that the players can have uh kind of a, a recollection of what they've made they can also uh you know correctly earn or be attributed revenue based on what they're doing in the game itself got it that makes sense um okay so let, let's go back to the example where like i, I want to play the game I, I go to the uh you know website marketplace i bought um a hero a, a, some gear some armor and let's say i spent like two hundred dollars right Mm -hmm. And I start playing the game and do I have to pay like an entry fee for a match? No, no. The, the gear itself is kind of the entry fee. Um, so there, there will be a minimum loadout. Like you can't go in without a gun uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to kill anyone. Um, and you could also enter, you know, if you don't have a gun, you could enter completely naked and you've not actually paid to get into the paid session type of thing. Um, so yeah, there, there is uh, the idea of a minimum entry, but it's the minimum entry required to actually engage in combat uh, is, is the way to think about it. But yeah, so there is, 
there is no other limits. There's nothing stopping you from paying the free, playing the free session. Uh, but if you if you go onto the marketplace, spend two hundred dollars, you could jump into a paid session. One of the things that we're uh, trying to do is make sure that the risk reward is balanced. It's also balance, balancing the entertainment. So say I queue up with one dollar, you queue up with ten. It's very unlikely that we'll match together because the only way to make that fair is for you to be exposed to ten dollars of potential value gained and me to one. And if we keep running into each other, that means that ten times you should kill me and one time I should kill you. So you'll also have, um, similar to how poker does table stakes, doing that within the game of shrapnel itself uh, to make sure it's still entertaining regardless of how much you paid uh, to get into that session. And I guess that's going to be matchmaking based on the yes. value of your NFTs, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, you, you said you need a minimum of a gun, right? Yeah, okay. so you need the minimum uh, kind of set of gear to actually engage in combat, which would which would be a gun. And what about the hero? The So the characters you don't necessarily need uh, to buy, you will have a set of, you know, base level characters that you can either choose to level up or not level up, and you can just choose those. Those are completely free. That's more of uh, the RPG progression. Uh, so you don't actually have to go and buy them. It's more something similar to World of Warcraft. You know, you can pay for that boost to get to level 100, whatever it is in the current patch, or you can, you know, level it up yourself. Uh, but they're always free at the base. You don't have to pay at all for that. So the, on the only fee to get into a paid session is the gear. Then, like, why would anyone buy the characters? Uh, because, you know, if, if someone's had... 20 hours worth of combat experience with their character, their reflexes will be a bit sharper. They might be faster. They could run for longer. They might have, um, when they aim down sight, that could happen quicker. There's a ton of uh, just experience style boosts that you could give. So having the best character might be something that's uh, of use to someone. Or what could have happened is, uh, you know, you could have a really old character that you've not healed. So they have a ton of permanent injuries and, you know, you need to start leveling up again because, this dude got shot in the leg so much and you never healed him and, and now it's busted and he's running really slow or he can't run for that long or he can't carry that much even. How were you thinking about like the average ownership, average character ownership per player in a sense that, you know, you mentioned that there would be different loadouts for those that mm -hmm. want to early game, want to collect, want to late game. Um, like if I own a character, would I be able to craft through, you know, some maybe items through some, some, some potions? Would I be able to craft the different loadout or would I have to yes. buy different characters? Yeah. So when you're like in the, in the system we've got, you can break, uh, guns exist in different tiers and you can break those down into the actual individual components, uh, where, you know, those components can be mixed and matched, uh, to make guns that would fit various play styles. You you wouldn't be able to, you know, mix pistol components with uh, an AR component, but it is the idea that you can maybe increase the firing rate on your SMG uh, because you like to be upfront and personal, but you don't you don't want to have, uh, you, and you're okay with recoil. Or you could reduce the fire rate, or maybe add some stock uh, to keep the you know the recoil low. So there's there's a ton of ton of stuff that we can do uh, in terms of the player crafting side, so that. You know, when you acquire gear, you might be looking for a specific piece because it has uh, something that when you break it down, you can add it to your weapon and it more more better fits your play style. So that's where the uh, more digging into the RPG section comes in. You might go into a session looking for specific pieces to build up your gear. And that might take three sessions of, you know, trying to acquire different parts of a loadout before you go, okay, cool. I have the thing that I want to play with. Let me go in. Got it. That makes sense. Okay, so so going back to my example, you know, I bought two hundred dollar worth uh, NFTs. I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play my first match. Um, I have the the necessary you know minimum NFT requirements, um, and then the second minute I get killed. Right? Do I lose yeah. everything I just bought? Yeah. If if you bought vanity items, no. But if if you bought two hundred dollars worth of NFTs and went went into the game with all of them, yes. At that point, you have lost everything. There are some games can be uh, painful if you don't manage your risk correctly. Hopefully, what someone would do is, you know, if they bought $200 of NFTs, they would buy that to play 200 individual games with as opposed to, you know, spending the whole bank on playing one game. 
And that is obviously something on our side that we'll be communicating to people. It's like, hey, this is something you're going to lose. Are you okay with that uh, if you die? Even the characters are gone? No, the characters would, would remain. Um, but, you know, uh, they could, that's something where you have to heal them up again, which kind of comes into the, the injuries and that side of things. Got it. I mean, in that case, it would be important for the, the NFTs that would be gone to, mm -hmm. um, to be relatively affordable, right? So yes. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you yeah, have so a plan on capping the prices of the NFTs? Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that we want to do is, uh, kind of market make on the lowest tier of gear. Uh, so that if someone's paying to get in, it is always, you know, going to be uh, somewhat the same price. And that also helps, uh, especially on the Web2 side, uh, those people don't have to worry about speculating on, on gear price if they're paying to get into the session. They know, hey, I can always enter. I'm just going to use arbitrary numbers here. Uh, I can always enter for $1 and I can always leave for $0.95. Cents. Um, and what we'll do is say, because it's going to be an order book style marketplace, say there's no people offering gear below a dollar. Uh, we'll just mint it for people when they want to buy in at a dollar. And then if there's no one purchasing at 95 cents, we'll turn around and be the, the buyer of last resort as well. So it keeps it range bound. So it allows players to trade between each other, but it stops you know running into problems like Axie and Cravada had where you can have assets that are over $800 just to get into the game. But it also stops that, hey, I just spent $200 on the game. I woke up the next day and everything's worth 100 and I haven't even played yet. Uh, that there's keeping it within a certain level of tolerance uh, for the players so that there, there is consistency. Because I think that is the main fear that a lot of people will have, especially coming from Web2, is how are you going to keep these assets consistent? And it is very simple. We can, we'll can we we'll sell it to you, but we'll also buy it off you. Simple as that. Okay. So let's, let's, let's elaborate on that maybe with a simple example. Let's say there's a mm -hmm. gun, right? Um, you wanna you wanna have a price target of around one dollars, but you you know, you give give um you don't mind the range of you know nine five cents to one dollar five cents, right? Yes. Um, whenever let's say I bought it the gun at one dollars, and I want to sell it, but there's not enough demand, and actually the demand is going down. A lot of people want to sell, and now it's trading at ninety five cents. You use your own treasury funds to mm -hmm. buy market make so that it yes. doesn't drop below ninety five cents, right? Exactly, exactly. And and whenever there is a lot of demand and that the 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 guns now trading at on the secondary market is trading at you know um, one point five cents and there's even more demand and it's it looks like it's going to go up. What you do is you. Um, do you mint more and sell it to the market or do you enable players to mint through like uh, mint and yeah sell? so it would it would effectively look like an infinite sell wall at one 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 dollar five cents um, so from the player side they're basically minting gear on demand because there isn't enough uh, to satiate that demand and it's the same on the on the 95 cent side to the player it looks like an infinite buy wall where they can just sell as much into that as possible Um on our end, we are minting for them on demand and then burning it as soon as we purchase it off them. Yeah. I mean, so the price capping idea, I like it because, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, I like the stability idea. Yes. In my opinion, players, um, like some of them, yes, they do like speculation, but I think some assets, especially like crucial strategic in-game NFT assets, shouldn't be very volatile in price. Otherwise, players you, you push players to make a lot of decisions at the same time, and it's just unpractical. Exactly. Um, so I love this idea of stability, and I love the idea of like you almost becoming this like central bank and just minting more or like buying back, doing all these open market operations. Um, and I also do like really like the price capping idea. However, um, the price floor idea, I think that is that is kind of uh risky just because it yes. does remind me of luna in a sense that you know if a couple of hedge funds just try to like break down that peg uh, for for multiple you know nfts um they might um they might deplete your treasury yeah so one of the the benefits of the way the game works so at best it is zero sum uh which means 
for a weapon to exist, it would have had to at least been minted once. And therefore, you know, say it's uh, for every $1 brought in or one gun brought in, on average, 0.95 is, is brought out or 0.9 is brought out. Uh, that means that, you know, uh, we will be minting more than uh, kind of will be burning because some will actually get burned in session as opposed to uh, through the market. So with the treasury would always have more uh, in it than uh, we'd need to actually purchase uh, and make sure the floor is stable. Because unfortunately, we have the difference between us and Lunar is it's not one to one. Uh, we do have a kind of bounded. Uh, I mean, I guess you could call it profit based on what we're doing because we're offering like a service for consistency, and there will be uh, effectively uh, there is a margin there to be made. It's not like with Lunar, uh, where you can do uh, large scale manipulations. Yeah, and and again, like. Um, I agree with you. The say the gun market is not going to be billions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, like, it's not going to be like even if someone tries to break it, it's not going to make a huge damage. And those that try to break the pack actually are going to lose, unless the games become like a like a billion dollar market, and you know, hedge yeah. funds are able to borrow like the gun NFTs and 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 short it, which I do think is like difficult yeah that it's going to be extremely difficult to attempt to execute that and that is something that we're aware that uh could happen and there are measures kind of in place like if you immediately try and sell a million weapons to us we're very aware that you're not a player um and we're going to make sure that you can't just do that and then you know as with luna what they did is they manipulated the price of the token at the same time so th there's a lot of factors that come into play and we're we're, we're very uh, kind of astute when it comes to potential problems that kind of happen in economic models like this. Got it. Yeah, good, good, good to hear that. Um, and in terms of the loots produced, so, you know, when you say zero-sum game in, in, mm -hmm. in a sense that um, if we're both playing and you kill me, you get all the items I have. Yes. So your earnings are my loss. It's a zero-sum. But... Um, there are what you said is that there are going to be some like loots around the game as you discover. Um, how are you thinking about that? Be like because as you will be minting more assets yes. for each yeah. game, and that will just create more inflation. No? Yeah. So there's there's the aspect of player capacity. So like what you can physically carry based on you know the loadout that you've taken in or the way that you've developed your character. And then there is kind of the, the drop ships is what I use as the example. Uh, you can get, which are the things that people use to, you know, put their gear in and get out of the session. You can put weight limits on those. Um, so on aggregate, what you're aiming for is a net neutral or net deflationary ecosystem. And you would do that with both the drop ships and the, the player carrying capacity. But if you look at a game like Tarkov and most extraction shooters, typically uh, what you actually end up uh, with is roughly a, for every one brought in, 0.2 is brought out. So what you're really trying to facilitate is actually inflation. Uh, you want to you know, be giving gifts out as much as possible, making it easier for people to extract. Um, but yeah, we, we're designing it so that we have all the controls to make sure inflation beyond uh, kind of, well, an increase in assets is never a problem. Uh, to the point where, you know, we have the systems in place. So if, if the game is aggressively net deflationary, we can make the adjustments, but also that we're protected and we never turn it into a game where inflation runs wild and we can't control it. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, the fact that you can carry everything actually makes things much easier. Yeah. Right? You can model exactly. Yeah. It also keeps it realistic because, like, you know, if, it's not like Minecraft where you can carry uh, five metric tons of gold. Uh, we want to have a a realistic style uh, shooter where you know th there's only so many things that you can put in a backpack. Yeah, and I, and I assume that you know. Um, like we discussed matchmaking of matching players who have $20 worth assets with, you know, uh, similar, similar levels. Mm -hmm. um, probably the loots that one can um, extract would be at similar values, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Because it's all about exposing people to that risk reward balance um, and making sure that, you know, if you're going into a $1 session, the loot kind of emulates 
that you brought $1 in. If you're going into the $20 session, the loot emulates that you brought $20 in, as well as the players as well. Because uh, you can class players as loot. They're just moving and, and shooting at you. Okay. Um, you, you know, going back to the marketplace example, mm -hmm. um, do I usually make payments with the Shrap, Shrapnel token? Yes. So there's there's the everything will be traded through the marketplace with Shrap. Um, however, one thing that we want to do is have players be able to sit with you know a stable coin or US dollars, um, so that they don't have to worry about the speculation value. So what we would do there is convert you know, USDC to Shrap, purchase from the marketplace, and then they'd get the NFT. And on the other side, it would be they sell the NFT into Shrap, and that's converted into USDC. Because again, Web C players, they, you don't want to have them onboard a lot of fiat. And then, you know, day two, they come in and it's like Shrap had either a massive pump or a massive dump. And they're like, well, I had $10 yesterday, now I've got five. What you want them to do is like, oh, I've got $10 today, I've got $10 tomorrow. That's that's the system that they need to be a part of. Yeah, exactly. Um, and would there be only one token? Yeah, so we, we only have one token, I think. Uh, one of the reasons for that is it's very easy to communicate to the player. It's like, hey, there is this one token. Obviously, you can have your US dollars as, as uh, kind of your the money that you have to purchase things, uh, but one token to rule them all, mainly because uh, if, if you look at something like Axie, what you're doing is separating a player class who are running SLP to the investor class who are running AXS. And there is some kind of down governance properties to the investor class. And you, you know you're separating the people that are playing the game for entertainment and the people that are trying to extract as much value from people playing the game as possible, and that's not a mutually beneficial like they're, they're not working together in tandem there; they're actually working in opposite ends. So all of that decision goes to the the player base as, as opposed to the investor base for us. Okay, what is going to be the utility of the shrapnel token? So. The, the medium exchange, every purchase goes through the SHRAP token on the marketplace. Uh, it's also, uh, we have a DAO governance incentive, so uh, not kind of nebulous activities that don't really make much sense. What we're doing is we're letting players decide on the creator portion, what is good content and what is bad content. You can think of it similar to the Google algorithm. So half of it is is kind of popularity, but that initial section on how they rank it uh, for the website is based on uh, backlinks. And our version of backlinks is people staking the token, saying, hey, I'm putting $200 against this map to say this is a good map. And then therefore we can say on our ranking system, okay, people are willing to put money against this and say it's good. So we'll start seeding it into the content. And then, you know, you can let popularity take, take the wheel. Yeah, so it's a way for people to effectively promote and push content that they've made or other people have made. And you can use things like quadratic voting, and we have a reputation system to make sure if you're consistently pushing good content, your opinion is amplified. If you're pushing bad content, we reduce that uh, a little bit as well, uh, with uh, the rewards for that being some portion of the revenue generated for pushing the content. Because you know people are on the platform, they're playing, they're spending some kind of money, you'd hope. Uh, and, and you get a, a, some attribution for that. With the earlier you stake, the more you get. Because say, you know, you come along and you vote on the most popular map in the game. It is by far the most popular. It's, you know, a million daily active users. Uh, that opinion, although great, doesn't mean much to us because we already know it's the best map. But if you go out and you're the first person to stake on a, a piece of content and it then becomes the most popular map, your opinion was extremely valuable as it kickstarted that process uh, for, us to, for us to have that content on the platform. So you would get a much greater share of the uh, rewards than someone that comes in later on. Rewards from that map or overall rewards? Uh, from that map itself. Uh, so, you know, there, there is a portion of the, the tokens. So, you know, 33% goes to the community and it would be from that bucket, as well as revenues that are generated. Um, we attribute some of those to kind of our ecosystem of map creators, map hosters, and stakers. So you would get some portion of the rewards based on how early you staked and how much you staked. Interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. To reward activity. 
Exactly. And I think it's a much better way, at least initially, like you can have people decide on various game, game events, uh, and, and that type of thing. But initially I think content curation staking is, is a very nice, uh, use case. It's, it's niche. It's uh, very easy to communicate and it's something that makes sense. You're effectively purchasing. I mean, you're not going to lose the tokens. You can withdraw them at any point, but you're purchasing, uh, like advertisement power to the ecosystem, which you could earn off. Um, like later down the line, uh, what we can do is you can make game game related decisions, but I think that's going to be more, uh, kind of towards your reputation system. For example, if you play 10,000 hours of the game, well, we're really going to respect your opinion because you know, the game inside out, if you played 10 hours of the game, well, that's another question, you know, you could make a decision and you don't really know what you're talking about. And then, you know, you also have the creator side and the player side. So if you've never touched creator tools, we shouldn't really give you decisions in that area. So a lot of that's going to be more to do with reputation. What you're seeing a kind of a lot of games proposes as DAO governance is not going to be directly from token from us. Got it. Yeah. It's, I think it's uh, out of, out of, you know, looking at a lot of different staking models, this one is definitely very interesting. Yeah. I think one of the, the key things we want to do is make sure that anytime you're receiving value from us, it is when you have created value on the platform. And one of the best ways for staking to create value on it, on a gaming ecosystem is discovering content that other people are creating, because at the end of the day, that keeps people on the game because there's more fun content. There's a diverse selection and that is great value for us. And therefore we can reward you for it. Just saying, Hey, stake this and get 10% APY doesn't really make any sense on a gaming platform. So we need you to do value additive activities. And if we find more, that is something that will incentivize in, in the same kind of manner. Got it. Okay. And, and going back to the, the, the shrap token, you know, it's going to be the medium of exchange, but also it's going to accrue the value, right? So for example, um, whenever there's a price cap and you guys decide that you are minting a new, um, mm -hmm. gun and selling it to the market, that, that would be, you know, those earnings would be paid in trap token and that those earnings yes. would accumulate in the treasury, right? Yes. Yes. So any, any minting of content, any market making activities that we do, all of that would, would accrue, uh, like increase the token value, um, in, in some capacity, as well as, as a network, uh, we use strap, um, like, you know, typically like any layer one or layer two does the underlying token of the network is the strap token. Um, and you know, in, in the distant future, uh, you know, once that we've proven that the tech stack that we've built works, it will be the same for other people that use uh, kind of a copy of our network to build their games on top of, but that is way out in the future. But right now it is medium of exchange, minting content curation by voting and then network security. Got it. Yeah. I like the, the gas, gas token idea as well. It's going to be additional yeah. revenue. Exactly. One thing, uh, to be clear though, is for the web two users and the web three users, it's a gasless experience. Um, you know, you bake things into transaction fees and that kind of thing to make sure that you know, if a web two user joins the platform, signs in with email and password, and then is immediately asked when they queue into a game, Hey, pay us eight cents because that's the gas fee. They're just going to turn the game off. So what you do instead is you exactly. take that into marketplace fees, the minting fee, all of that kind of stuff. You subsidize it in other areas and then make it a gasless experience for them up front. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a no brainer. I mean, a lot, most of the games and user uh, oriented apps should definitely do that as well. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so like, let's say, let's go back to the, the example I gave, you know, you have some earnings in trap, right? You sold a primary, um, gun because you wanted to keep the price cap. Would those trap tokens in your treasury be burned immediately or would they just sit and you might decide on what to do with those in the future? Yeah. Uh, uh, initially, uh, like current thinking is we just sit on them. Um, the, the system is designed to have 3 billion tokens, but we might find that we'll never mint more tokens that I think that's very toxic for an ecosystem. 
Uh, but there, there is a chance that we could decide to burn some of those tokens. Yes, like uh, we might find that you know we want to lock in the price uh, increase that has happened for that for various economic reasons on the strap side. Uh, we might want to show the community that hey, we're not going to distribute these tokens to investors type of thing. So yes, look, the, the option to burn is there, but our current strategy is just to hold and sit on them and have them as, as treasury assets. What about the fiat payments? You know, if I if I pay it in fiat and you earn in fiat, um, would you then just buy back the trap token to accrue value? Or do you have a different value accrued for that? So the, the way any fiat transfers work is it goes from the fiat to the token, then to whatever you're purchasing on the platform. But from the user experience side, they don't see that set of interactions. They just see fiat to asset. Whereas in the back end, we're doing fiat to token to asset. So it's still going through the token. So net buy pressure, you know, from players onboarding with fiat still goes uh, to shrap itself. Nice. So, so, so actually, like if I'm buying $10 worth NFT on the back end, first, you know, let's say I'm using PayPal, um, that $10 worth uh, PayPal transaction is converted into $10 worth shrap tokens, and yes. then it is converted into the NFT. Exactly, exactly. Because the, the, it is the entire medium of exchange, but we're just abstracting uh, that uh, kind of middle swap away from the user because they don't need to see that. We're communicating as little information as possible to them to make it as simple for them as possible. Are you working with a, like a middleware provider to achieve that? Uh, yes, yeah, we, like we have to, otherwise uh, we'd need MTL licenses. So yeah, we, we have service providers for the fiat onboarding portion of this. And would you be able to like name them? I can't right now, unfortunately not. Uh, you'll be able to, so one of the, the laws is uh, people have to see who they're dealing with. So you would be able to see them when the game is live, but right now uh, that's, that's not something I can disclose. Okay, no problem. Um, and would that be allowed in like a lot of countries or would there be some countries that that wouldn't be allowed? Yeah, we're working with as many providers as possible so that what we can do is uh, we can say, hey, it's very, I'll, I'll pick a country like Brazil, which uh, is a huge FPS market. The kind of rejection rate in that country varies a lot. Um, and what we do is we pick the provider that gives you the, the greatest chance of success. Or, you know, certain providers don't even provide the service there. Uh, and then it's same with every other country where we're, we're going to optimize for getting that payment through as easily as possible by using well-known names in those regions. So it's not about picking one partner. It's about picking as many as possible and then saying, you know, whoever does the best business gets the most business. What do you mean by failure rate? So if you look at crypto related payments, uh, the average acceptance rate or uh, is around 60 something percent. So the average failure rate is around 40 or 30 something percent. Um, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that it's as simple for the users as possible, uh, where, you know, they don't keep getting their card rejected or even completely declined because there's certain uh, fiat on-ramp providers. For example, I'm from the UK, where if your bank interacts with them, they immediately like kind of uh, close your account down and say, hey, you need to call us and, and reopen it and uh, kind of reactivate everything. Uh, so we're going to optimize so that we do put you in touch with the providers where it has the highest chance of going through. Got it. Interesting. Yeah, I see that um, we're we're past ahead of our, our schedule time, so I, I wouldn't want to keep you waiting no problem. longer. It's been, um, a, it's been a good conversation, though. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I can I can go on for hours, but I, I just because I, I love these topics, but uh, mm -hmm. I believe it was a really really good conversation. And and before I let you go, I want to ask um, about kind of the timeline. You know, when mm -hmm. the game is being launched, when are the NFTs are going to get launched, tokens, etc. And anything you wanna you wanna share with the audience? For sure. Yeah. So in terms of token, that is something that uh, will kind of be announcing things around that very soon. Uh, we, we do need it to launch, you know, various things on the platform, such as minting content and, and all that stuff. So that needs to exist uh, essentially before, you know, the game is fully playable. In terms of the game, I'll say that we've been developing for about around a year and nine months. Typically a AAA game takes two to three years to develop. 
we're on the kind of faster end of that spectrum, so I'll let people do some maths and kind of figure out what I'm getting at there. So yeah, the first playable will be on the, the earlier end of that two to three year spectrum. Awesome. Thanks for joining, man. It was a great conversation. Yeah, it's been great. I love the question you've asked. Uh, a lot of unique ones that I don't often get. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, listener, thanks for listening to the episode and see you on another episode. See ya.